Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the front row. Uh, my name is Jamie Williamson, and uh, I am an, the executive vice president here at Scripps. And, uh, and today's guest uh, is uh, Professor Howard Hang, who's going to tell us about the microbiome. Uh, let me give you a little brief bio about, uh, about Howard. So Howard uh, got his uh, BS in chemistry at University of California, Santa Cruz. And he went on to do his doctoral work in chemistry at, uh, at Berkeley. Following a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, he joined the faculty at the Rockefeller University in 2007. And we were very fortunate to recruit Howard here to Scripps in uh, 2020. So uh, what's, what's uh, on, on the menu for today? So it's the microbiome. And Howard is uh, what I would call a chemical biologist. He uh, uses the tools of chemistry to attack uh, biological problems, uh, but with a very chemical uh, perspective. Uh, so the microbiome, of course, is the set of microbes that's associated with your body. There might be microbes all over your skin, uh, and, but primarily uh, the, the, the biggest part of your microbiome is your gut flora. So what's inside your whole intestinal tract? Now, E. coli is, is the classic example of a, of a gut microbe. Uh, it's, it's really, it's one of the first organisms that was sequenced. It's a classic laboratory organism, but it's actually in everybody's body. And of course, uh, people are aware that E. coli can be a pathogenic bacteria. So if you uh, get meat that's contaminated with certain strains of E. coli, it can be very damaging. I, I think uh, everyone can at least relate to what happens when your microbiome gets out of whack. Uh, my own first experience with a microbiome came in the mid-1990s, uh, and it, it turned out I had uh, an infection of Helicobacter pylori, which was a major human pathogen that's associated with your gut. And no one really knew that there was this link to getting ulcers, and so I did a three-course a uh, three-month course of antibiotics to, to get rid of it. But this is a natural bacterium that has an effect on a disease outcome. Uh, I think everyone is aware of probiotics. And I must say that, you know, initially I was pretty skeptical of, you know, this, but it's, it's very clear that it, how you feel and the contents of your guts really depends on your diet and what you eat and how you eat. And as I mentioned, when it gets out of whack, it's not particularly pleasant. So it's very clear there's a connection between your gut and your health. But as scientists, we want to understand what is that connection. It, it, we don't want to just understand there's a correlation. We want to know the where and the why. So the big question about the microbiome is how does the content of your guts affect your health and the progression of, of certain kinds of diseases? So your, your gut is filled with all different kinds of bacteria. I'm sure Howard's going to talk more about that, but it's basically a food fight. Uh, it's, it's a food fight in that uh, you know, all these bacteria are you know, in your gut. They're uh, competing for resources and trying to colonize the gut. And what we're really just starting to understand now are the specific connections between what's going on there, all the nutrients inside the gut, and the, the outcome of bacteria, uh, sorry, the outcome of, of disease. So what you're gonna hear today from Howard is this remarkable set of connections. And one of, one of the most remarkable is the contents of your gut determine how effective chemotherapy might be. And, and so it's that question, it's not the correlation of gut and health, it's the causation. How does what's in your gut actually have the effect that it does. And that's what Howard is a world's expert at. And uh, that's what he's going to talk about today. So uh, again, Howard, uh, welcome. Looking forward to your talk. And I'll join back at the end uh, and we'll have a little discussion. So take it away, Howard. Welcome you all today to the front row lecture. It's really my pleasure uh, to be sharing some of the work my lab has been doing on the microbiome. Uh, again, I'm Howard Hang, um, and I'm a professor in the immunology and microbiology department, as well as the chemistry department here at Scripps Research. Uh, and today I'll tell you more about how we've been using uh, more reductionist approaches to really understand mechanisms, how gut microbes interact with your immune system and how that influences our susceptibility to infection, and how that modulates the efficacy of chemotherapy. Okay, 
So just to recap what Jamie already said in the introduction, um, you know, with all the bad news we've had recently about how microbes are, are harmful to us, I would remind you all that, um, you know, microbes are ubiquitous uh, and cover the surfaces of our body um, and are very prominent in our gut um, and can be beneficial to our health. And just for a little terminology here, um, I just want to sort of highlight that we often um, refer to this community of bacteria, uh, viruses, and fungi um, in our mucosal surfaces as the microbiota, which characterizes the microorganisms. And the microbiome is a description of the genetic material within our microbiome. Um, what's important here is that the microbiota and the microbiome encode very unique biological activity that I'll show you modulates health and disease. Um, Jamie already mentioned a bit a few of these numbers, but um, it's very clear these days that um, there's large numbers of bacteria um, within our surfaces, in particular in our gut. So for example, in the colon, folks have estimated that the numbers of individual bacteria roughly are comparable to the number of red blood cells we have in our body. And within each of us, there's probably um, hundreds of, of individual bacterial species. And if you sort of do a rough uh, back of the envelope calculation, if there's 5,000 genes or so for every bacterial species times 100 or so, um, you know, that's a significant number of more genes that we have in the microbiome than our, in our human genome. Uh, what's important about um, these genes is that you can code unique activities, small molecules, proteins, metabolites that can modulate our physiology and um, our health. Um, what's complicated about the microbiome is that um, the microbiome can vary between the different locations. So for example, bacterial species that are in your gut may differ from those in your skin. It varies significantly between individuals. So myself and Jamie, for example, have got a very different uh, composition of microbiota. It varies with our age, our diet, our use of antibiotics. Um, but many studies now um, have really correlated the composition of the microbiota with physiology and disease. So for example, the microbiota can help us metabolize food. Um, and when dysregulated, it can lead to malnutrition and obesity. Um, the presence of these microbes also primes our immune system and leads us to um, resistance to infection, modulates inflammation, and also contributes to the onset of cancer. Okay. Um, there's also a connection between the microbes and our um, nervous system. So, um, you know, it's been thought that um, there's a direct connection between the microbes and the signaling to the brain. And often I always think about maybe this is one of the reasons why we get angry. Um, beyond this feature, uh, the microbes in our gut also modulate the metabolism of drugs, and as I'll show you later on today, the efficacy of immunotherapy. Um, there's many notable examples of how the microbiota modulates human health. Um, maybe a couple ones that I think are quite interesting are uh, a couple of years ago, the New York Times um, highlighted this paper how um, marathon runners may have different microbes in their gut, and in fact, they may have microbes that consume lactic acid more than others, and that this may lead to you know, better running performances. Okay? Um, beyond this example, um, you can also find that the microbiome has been very exciting and even has its own exhibit in the Natural History Museum in New York. And those of you that have visited a few years ago um, may have noticed this as well. And this is actually a photo that I took myself when I visited the Natural History Museum a few years ago. Uh, beyond these studies, I just want to highlight a few um, you know, notable studies here at Scripps Research from my colleagues. Um, so a few of you might have already attended uh, my colleague Reza Gadiri's seminar on how the microbiome modulates cardiovascular disease uh, a few months ago. And um, we're also ha happy to recruit uh, Michael Constantinides in the lab as a new assistant professor who's been um, studying how the microbiome modulates specific subsets of uh, T cells in the gut and also in the skin, and that this might impact um, the behavior of animals in early life and tissue repair. Um, so beyond these studies, um, today I'll really focus on how the microbiome modulates um, cancer therapy and infection. Okay? Um, we know now that the presence of these microbes are important signals to our immune system and modulates um, the level of immune activity in the gut and other tissues. Um, but what's been surprising is that the microbiome maybe also modulates the impact of our therapies that we're exploring these days. Um, so cancer immune therapy is probably a topic that I don't need to give a a long introduction. This has been a remarkable discovery in immunology. Um, the discovery of these checkpoints on T cells, which um, renders them sort of inactive when they're overprimed, um, has also led to the discovery that when these T cells um, are not fully active, they don't sufficiently kill cancer cells. But the discovery of these antibodies that can block the activity of these checkpoints can unleash these breaks on T cells and allow them to survey tissues to kill cancer cells. And this remarkable discovery was noted um, by the 2018 Nobel Prize in Medicine. 
Uh, and the development of these antibodies or inhibitors of the immune checkpoints has allowed um, the use of these um, compounds to unleash the, the activity of T cells to clear cancer cells. Um, so on the right here are actually survival curves from some colleagues of ours in, at Sloan Kettering to show the responsiveness of melanoma patients when they're treated with these checkpoint inhibitors um, to unleash the activity of T cells to clear tumors. And, and as you can see, um, the discovery of cancer immune delivery has been really transformative. You can see that the patient survival with individual combinations of these checkpoint inhibitors has significantly increased the lifespan of cancer patients. What's interesting here is a, um, a number of patients are still non-responsive to these remarkable immunotherapies. Uh, and the reasons for this are quite complicated. They'd be the differences in host genetics between patients, their, their immune systems, their behavior, and their diet. Um, but what's been very exciting in the microbiome field recently is that there's been a connection of how gut microbes may modulate the efficacy of cancer immunotherapy, which is highlighted by the cover of science uh, a couple of years ago. And this cover really um, highlights three sort of notable papers by several different laboratories, which suggest that the gut microbiome composition of patients influences um, their receptiveness or uh, efficacy of cancer immunotherapy in the patients. So it suggests that different composition of gut microbes within individuals might influence um, how they respond to cancer immunotherapy. And in animal models, we and others have shown that actually antibiotics, for example, that clear gut microbiota from animals uh, renders cancer immunotherapy uh, not effective. Okay. Um, so these studies suggest that specific species may be important for uh, immunotherapy efficacy in cancer patients. Um, and more recently, uh, two really notable studies suggest that if you take the microbiota from one individual and give it to a cancer patient that's receiving immunotherapy, this may actually enhance um, their efficacy of immunotherapy. So this is schematized here on the right. These sort of cartoons suggest that some individuals that receive a non-responsive microbiota may not have no impact on the tumor growth. However, some individuals that have received active microbiota may actually um, promote or enhance the efficacy of immunotherapy and help shrink tumors in, in patients. And here's actually one really uh, illustrative graph of this new feature. Um, so these are cancer patients that receive different microbiota uh, transplants. In the blue, those individuals got a microbiota transplant from one donor, and you can see that there's no major effect on the tumor growth. However, the other group of individuals got uh, a microbiota transplant from a different donor, and you can see those individuals actually have significant decreases in their um, uh, tumor size over time. which suggests that there's something special about the microbiota of donor number one that leads to the enhancement of cancer immunotherapy. Um, so to understand uh, this more deeply, uh, many labs and, and uh, um, our laboratory as well has used DNA sequencing to explore the composition of the microbiota. And so to understand what species are present in uh, different individuals, you can extract the DNA from the microbiome, um, subject it to now very um, cost-effective um, advanced sequencing methods for DNA. And this can be read out. And by reading the DNA out of the bacterial um, DNA extracts, you can now backtrack and figure out what bacterial species are in different individuals. Okay. Uh, and so some of the data looks like this here. Here's a uh, sort of heat map of different patients or individuals that respond or don't respond to cancer immunotherapy. And on the list here is the number of bacterial species that are associated with different individuals. And you can see here by the heat map that some bacterial species appear to be enriched in response to patients compared to those that are non-responsive. Um, but one major challenge in the field uh, and for those that are interested in mechanisms of microbiome, microbiota species is uh, which one of these bacterial species is really the causative factor and how does it do that to enhance the efficacy of immunotherapy? And on the right here, I just wanna highlight some challenges for exploring the microbiome. Uh, many of these microbes are host or disease specific, as you can see here on the left. Uh, many of these microbes grow under anaerobic conditions and sometimes cannot be cultured uh, in, in the laboratory. One of the other challenges of starting microbiome interactions is that um, some microbes interact with each other, require their growth of, require the presence of other microbes for growth and activity. And often the activity from the microbiota may come from rare and minor species that are not very abundant. Okay? And that can also be challenging to isolate and characterize. And for many of these bacterial species, in contrast to E. coli, for example, we still happen to have limited genetic tools and chemical tools. And so, so these are some of the major challenges that scientists like myself and others are trying to tackle in the coming years to try to understand the functions and mechanisms of the specific microbiota species. Okay, 
So to do that, um, let me just summarize what I just said already is that the composition of um, bacterial species um, within the microbiota is correlated with their health and disease. Um, and some of these microbes may function as so-called endogenous adjuvants to prime our host immune system, but we still need to know what spectral species do that uh, and which are the mechanisms by which they act. Okay. Um, so to address these challenges, uh, my laboratory at Scripps uh, Research has taken two general approaches to explore the activity of uh, different microbiota and their corresponding metabolites. Uh, as Jamie noticed, uh, noted already, I'm a chemist, and so some of these molecules or small molecules that are, that are generated by the bacteria. And we use chemical approaches to understand their signaling pathways and their mechanisms of action. Today, I really focus on how um, we've used animal models to explore individual microbiota species. Um, and the hopes of the bush is, uh, of this work is to understand their mechanisms of action. In doing so, we want to be able to determine uh, new approaches for therapeutics and develop new diagnostics. And for my group in particular, we want to do this in the context of infection and cancer. All right, um, so one of the approaches we've taken to use animal models is to use small cost-effective animal models as surrogates uh, for studies in humans. Uh, and one uh, animal model that I got, I got attracted to uh, several years ago is using uh, worms as a surrogate, for example, the mammalian gut, okay? And so here's a cartoon of the worm anatomy. Um, you can see here that this, even the worms don't have adaptive immune responses, they do have features that are quite similar to ours. Um, and those of you that um, actually um, have interacted with worms know that worms naturally interact with microbes in their environment in the soil and in compost. And so they're naturally evolved to, to interact with diverse microbes and may have actually evolved specific mechanisms to detect and engage microbes in the environment. And for these reasons, we thought it might be interesting to use worms as an animal model to explore individual microbiota species as a cost-effective way of exploring uh, hundreds of different bacterial species that we're now identifying. Okay. Um, so um, many years ago now, a very adventurous graduate student, to meet around my lab, set up the system um, where we could take adolescent worms, uh, put them on a plate of specific microbiota species, and then challenge these worms with an infection, such as salmonella type of okay. uh, So some of these assays look like this. Here are the video of uh, worms. This is a worm that's on a natural food source for um, C. elegans, uh, where it's cruising around on a plate looking for more bacteria to eat. Okay. Uh, this worm in the middle here, there's actually a worm that's been exposed to Salmonella typhimurium. You can see here that, that the worm is not very happy about it. And it's kind of curled up, kind of reminds me of when I choose the wrong food cart when I visit New York City. Um, in contrast, this worm on the right was first exposed to this organism, Enterococcus species, but now it's still infected with Salmonella typhimurium. You can see here that um, despite the fact that it's been exposed and infected by Salmonella, it's actually quite happy and still cruising along looking for more food to eat. Uh, in fact, maybe the only difference you can see is that it's a little chubby, okay? Um, so using these kind of behavioral assays, we can evaluate individual microbiota species. Uh, but beyond these sort of movies, we can also do this more quantitatively in a high throughput fashion. So these worms are quite inexpensive and we can grow lots of them and use them in a multiplex manner in 96 well plates to explore different conditions, um, to evaluate mechanisms and specific factors that impact um, susceptibility to infection and backtrack the mechanisms of the microbiota. So on the bottom panel here, you can see we can very readily discriminate live and dead worms. And on the right here is now a survival curve of worms that were first exposed to different conditions um, of bacterial species. And you can see here that in the black line is a normal lifespan of C. elegans in this assay. Um, and the red line is uh, C. elegans that are infected with Salmonella typhimurium. You can see they die more, uh, more quickly than those on control bacteria. Uh, on the green line here is um, worms that are first exposed to Antarctica species. And this is the worm on the right I showed you before that was cruising along just fine, even though it's exposed to Salmonella. Um, this is a very specific feature of worms that are first exposed to Antarctica species and not another bacterial species, such as bacterial um, B. satellites. Okay. Um, so we were quite excited about this observation, discovered that Bacillus could protect worms against infection. Um, so what is Enterococcus species? Uh, this is part of a large family of gram-positive bacteria that are in our microbiomes and also in the environment. Um, they're more famous for being drug resistant and major causes of healthcare associated infection, uh, which is quite problematic in the clinic. Uh, but these microbes um, have been found in diverse um, animals and in the environment um, and also could be beneficial. So now um, analyzing different species are now greater than 60 species of Enterococcus that have been identified. 
In Tarcoccus bacchaeus and Thesium, the most prominent in humans. Um, they constitute roughly 1% of the human microbiota by sequencing methods. These microbes are very tolerant to broad pHs, temperature, and osmotic conditions that allow them to um, occupy different niches, including in animals and also in soil. Um, but beyond being potential pathogens in the hospital setting, um, commensal strains or non-infectious strains of Tarcoccus um, are also known to be protective. In fact, in the States, you can actually buy for Florida, where the major ingredient is a particular strain of Antarcoccus um, thesium that is used as a uh, probiotic in pets. And in Europe, you can buy this formulation, biofluorin, which the major active ingredient here is Antarcoccus thesium as well. Okay? So beyond being potential pathogens, uh, Antarcoccus are potentially beneficial and, as I'll show you later, associated with cancer immunotherapy efforts. Um, so, having identified Enterococcus species as a protective species, one of the advantages of us using C. elegans was it's a really nice system for us to dissect mechanisms. Um, so, using these activity assays, which are cost effective, we can compare different genes between protective species of PCM versus Vicalis, uh, analyze specific proteins that are expressed in the protective organism and, and uh, compared to Vicalis that's not protective. And these many studies that we did over the years led us, led us to uh, discover um, Enterococcus specium um, produces a protein called secreted antigen A, okay? that's sort of cartooned here. And we discovered that secreted antigen A, um, when expressed in specium, uh, hydrolyzes um, cell wall fragments from bacteria and it produces immunologically active small molecules that then primes not only C. elegans but mice and prevents them from being infected from salmonella and other pathogens. So this is quite an exciting discovery, and here I'll just show you a couple of pieces of uh, further evidence for its biochemical activity. Uh, we were fortunate to solve the structure of SAGE, and here is a model of the um, X-ray structure of SAGE, which we were um, greatly sort of facilitated by previous structures of this related enzyme from Ian Wilson's lab here at Scripps Research. Uh, and you can see here from the space building model of SAGE, uh, it can really bind the small molecule very tightly in the active site. Biochemically, we determined that SAGE hydrolyzes small pieces of the bacterial cell wall. And this generates more active sort of so-called muropeptides, uh, which are known to signal to uh, host cells and activate uh, innate immune signaling pathways to promote immunity uh, in vertebrates uh, uh, and in, in mice. Okay. Uh, okay, so those discoveries and many other experiments led to this sort of cartoon model of how enterococcus and SAGE may be functioning. Uh, in the gut, uh, where the presence of enterococcus uh, and the expression of this enzyme cleave cell wall fragments to prime innate immunity in the gut that provides resistance to intestinal pathogens such as salmonella uh, and uh, others. Um, but beyond that, I'll show you later on that the generation of these small immunologically active metabolites may also prime uh, systemic immune responses and help us clear tumors in combination with cancer immunotherapy. Uh, so I'll just show you a little bit piece of data toward infection. Um, since um, SAGE from Enterococcus like species acts on the host, we also explored other microbial pathogens um, as a, um, to see if they could protect against other microbial pathogens. And one of particular interest is Clostridium difficile. This is another major hospital acquired infection um, that is quite problematic to treat. Um, and so in studies in mouse models, we showed that um, if you colonize mice with SAGE expressing bacteria, uh, it renders mice resistant to the pathogenesis that's induced by Clostridium difficile. So you can see here in the red line, PCM pre-colonized animals are really largely resistant to C. diff induced um, pathogenesis. Um, this is very specific to Enterococcus PCM. So other bacterial species, such as Enterococcus faecalis or Lactobacillus plantarum, don't do this very well. Um, but our discovery of SAGE led us to a very cool experiment, which is now to express SAGE into these non-protective bacterial species, ensure that the expression of SAGE itself was sufficient to improve host survival against C. diff infection. Okay. Uh, so there's just this one piece of data I wanted to show you, shows that how the discovery of a specific factor can lead to new therapeutic approaches towards uh, infectious diseases. Okay, um, so for the remainder talk, I'm going to focus on how uh, our discovery of Enterococcus um, pesium and SAGE's expression may also prime and enhance our efficacy, the efficacy of cancer immunotherapy. Um, so back to this chart, um, of bacterial species that are enriched in responsive patients and non-responsive patients. And it turns out if you look carefully in the patients that respond to immunotherapy, 
Uh, and Trichotis species is one of these bacterial species that is enriched in several of the re responsive individuals. Okay. Um, this is a summary of one study, and on the right here is a correlation map of bacterial species that are um, connected to the efficacy of immunotherapies. And in fact, Entrococcus species was found in multiple studies of um, cancer immunotherapy, suggesting that it actually might act very broadly um, in humans. Um, so we wondered whether uh, is Entrococcus species and Saigate's expression sufficient to actually enhance cancer immunotherapy? Uh, and in this context, um, we wanted to ask, you know, for those individuals that are non-responsive, perhaps in the future, we could give them a saga expressing probiotic or its metabolite to then turn the non-responsive individuals to be responsive to immunotherapy. Um, so we haven't done this in humans yet, um, but to model these uh, experiments in the future, we've actually used mouse models where we've taken mice um, that either have non-responsive microbiota or depleted of the microbiota altogether and ask whether a saga um, or particular bacterial species or its corresponding metabolite are sufficient to enhance the efficacy of immunotherapy in vivo. Uh, so one of the experiments that a talented postdoc, my lab, Matt Griffin, set up um, is shown here, where he can take mice that are known to harbor non-responsive microbiota, that administer Entrococcus uh, in their drinking water, these are aerobic bacteria, challenge them with a classic syngenic or immune competent uh, tumor um, just for melanoma, uh, and then subsequently administer immunotherapy over time. And Matt would monitor tumor growth, profile the immune response of the tumors, and also look at the microbiota. Uh, and so I just want to show you two pieces of data from Matt's one of these experiments is that, first of all, when we administer these bacteria, we don't really change the global composition of the microbiota in these mice. You can see they're all quite similar between different experimental samples. But what's quite remarkable is on the right, if you look at the tumor growth over time, you can see that mice that are colonized with Entrococcus species in combination with immunotherapy, so significantly impaired tumor growth uh, compared, compared to mice that are given Entrococcus faecalis. Uh, what's quite remarkable is we can make Entrococcus faecalis active by expressing SAGE in Entrococcus faecalis. And you can see that in the blue line there, that's almost as active as, as Entrococcus species itself. Okay. So these are quite exciting studies suggesting that um, the administration of Entrococcus species uh, could actually reprogram the activity uh, of the host microbiome and make it more receptive to cancer immunotherapy. Uh, so to do this more carefully, Matt actually um, did monoclonalization experiments in mice. So these experiments, we actually first depleted mice uh, of their endogenous microbiota by giving them antibiotics and then giving individual strains where we can actually now characterize where the monoclonalization of different bacterial species is sufficient by itself to enhance the efficacy of immunotherapy. Um, and so here on the bottom are two, two more tumor growth curves uh, for similar experiments that I showed you before here. Uh, with the different um, immunotherapy that have been used in the clinic. So antibodies to anti-CLA-4 or antibodies to PD-L1, um, both of which um, can be enhanced by co-colonization um, of these mice with Entrococcus species, not with Entrococcus faecalis, uh, but again, remarkably, the expression of Entrococcus, of SAGE into Entrococcus faecalis was sufficient to turn on the activity uh, in bacteria. Uh, Matt did a number of other studies here that I won't have time to share, but Matt also showed that the presence of these microbes activates myeloid cells that enhances um, the immune response to produce more active uh, T cells to clear the tumors. This, he also showed that we see increases in tumor specific T cells in the mice. And also based on the mechanism of action um, that I described before, um, we explored that the immune receptor, NOT2, was also required for this enhancement of tumor immunotherapy. Okay, so this leads us to sort of um, uh, describe the cartoon that I showed you in more detail here. Um, beyond um, priming the gut towards infection um, on the left here, um, the data I just showed you here suggests that the presence of enterococcus in the host and SAGE's expression could generate these small cell wall fragments, uh, which may be getting into the circulation, activating so called antigen presentation cells or myelin cells to directly clear tumors or enhance the activation of tumor specific T cells that also contributes to the tumor clearance. Uh, and this in combination really helps the efficacy of immunotherapy uh, when administered together. All right, so one of the questions we wanted to ask is, well, based on these data, you know, can we actually use SAGA expressing tricoccus in humans? Uh, and I'll just tell you that that's not a good idea based on what I showed you before. Um, due to the fact that these bacteria um, readily become resistant to existing antibiotics and may be problematic in the clinic. 
And furthermore, the presence can, these microbes can be um, sort of uh, drivers for inflammation and promote inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, in the context of transplantation, they, may, they also are known to bloom in the gut in response to antibiotic treatment and are correlated with poor survival um, and mortality during transplantation. Um, so this is one of the reasons why even though enterococcus are commensal species um, in our microbiota, they're not um, prescribed to be used in humans um, due to potential pathogenesis and drug resistance. Okay. Uh, however, one can think about getting around this problem by modifying probiotics. And so Jamie already mentioned in his introduction that uh, many of you are aware of different probiotics that you can um, get as dietary supplements in your yogurts and fermented foods. Unfortunately for many bacterial species or uh, probiotics, um, their effects on human health are quite unclear. Um, but one of the things that um, researchers uh, in our group has done is think about taking probiotics, which may be safely administered to humans and engineering them to encode interesting proteins or small molecules, they may actually be, have defined mechanisms of action. Um, so uh, for this purpose, Rise Therapeutics is actually licensed SAGE uh, from our laboratory and is using um, SAGE to engineer and improve probiotics to modulate host immunity. Um, so this is sort of schematized here on the left. So Lactococcus lactis, for example, is a probiotic that has been explored in humans. And using synthetic biology approaches, we can engineer Lactococcus lactis to express SAGE in each chromosome. Uh, and on the right here, what's quite remarkable is um, now that Lactococcus lactis expresses the SAGE, we can ask whether it affects the activity of cancer immunotherapy in a mouse model. Um, so again, here, Lactococcus lactis alone, the parent strain in the, in the like turquoise line here, shows no effect on tumor growth um, in a mouse model. But if you now uh, make that strain express SAGE, you can see in the purple line that it is almost as active as enterococcus species at inhibiting the growth of tumors in the mouse model. Um, for, along these experiments, we can also ask uh, mechanistic questions about SAGE and where we mutate the active site uh, of the enzyme. And here you can see here in the sort of uh, brown line here that um, an inactive version of SAGE is, no, is not effective at enhancing tumor immunotherapy, um, suggesting that the biochemical activity that we charge this for is really important for the efficacy of this enzyme for enhancing the efficacy of immune therapy in vivo. Um, this has also led to some, um, you know, suggestions in the lab over the years that we may be making a SAGE-based probiotic yogurt, um, and which is, I think, a quite interesting and I think potential future avenue for Rice Therapeutics. Um, but having been in San Diego for a little while now, I think one of the questions I started asking is wondered whether there's probiotic beers. And if you do a Google search for probiotic beer, you actually, there's actually this uh, graphic that you can find on the internet. Uh, which is quite interesting, which is actually connected to science. You can see here in this nice picture. Uh, and I guess one thing I would do here is to modify this a bit and ask whether we can uh, uh, express SAGE into um, to probiotics to perhaps make a SAGE IPA in the future. Okay, okay so all kidding aside, um, these engineered probiotic strains would be considered sort of um, drugs in the future and still need uh, actually a lot of safety um, evaluation before it can go into humans, okay, which is something that Rise Therapeutics is um, embarking on these days. Okay, um, so to come back to this cartoon again, um, I think I showed you a number of experiments now in data that supports the idea that um, the expression of SAGE in this, um, of this enzyme cleaving cell wall fragments from microbes can enhance intestinal immunity against infection and also prime systemic immune response that help clear tumors. Okay. Um, so one of the questions we were asking lately is, um, may there be other SAGE-like enzymes within the human microbiome? Okay. And so to do this, we've actually leveraged a number of studies from many labs in the field. Uh, you can see are highlighted in this recent, um, this issue of Nature a few years ago, uh, which is a collection of data uh, from many, many studies of uh, microbiome analysis from different sites and individuals um, and in a different disease context. So um, the workflow here sort of um, summarizes work from many, many laboratories sampling the microbiota composition uh, of different tissues uh, and different individuals um, in a variety of diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease and prediabetes and others. Uh, so leveraging this large data set, uh, Matt could ask, uh, are there, sa there SAGE-like enzymes within the human microbiome? And by doing so, uh, maybe there are other microbial species that may function like intercoccus species. Um, so, uh, the workflow that Matt engaged here is on the right by taking the sequence of the SAGE protein and gene, he can ask whether there are other related genes in the human microbiome. 
And on the right here is a correlation chart of different bacterial species, and there are genes that may be similar to uh, SAGE and Enterococca species. Uh, you can see from this chart that uh, all the other species um, of Enterococcus um, have clear um, SAGE orthologs that are very similar. Uh, but what's also interesting from this analysis is that other bacterial species that are highlighted on this graph, we have orthologs of SAGE that are um, quite similar as well. And this is something we're now exploring to determine whether other microbial species in the human microbiome may function in a similar fashion. Okay, so stay tuned for uh, our analysis of other maybe SAGE like enzymes in the human microbiome. Okay, um, I just want to highlight that this is a really remarkable uh, body of work from a really talented postdoc, Matthew Griffin, in the lab. Uh, who was supported by the Pope Funds for Cancer, uh, who's now here at Scripps Research as well. Uh, Matt's paper should be online in a couple of weeks. Uh, um, it's too bad that it was on online today. Uh, but those of you that want to read more details about Matt's work um, can look at his paper in a week or so. Uh, and then this work was also funded by the National Cancer Institute and the Melanoma Research Foundation. Uh, all right, so let me just contextualize um, what I described to you um, today in the context of what we and others are interested in uh, for how to leverage or harness um, our understanding of the microbiome for potential therapy um, and diagnostics. So one of the first features is trying to determine um, efficacy of, of immunotherapy. Um, so by understanding the presence of active microbes such as SAGE, we may predict whether different individuals might be um, receptive to immunotherapy. Um, the discovery of specific genes and mechanisms also provides us additional features to explore as biomarkers uh, for stool samples between patients um, to highlight unique factors that may be important determinants beyond just the presence of a microbial species. Um, so here again, SAGE is a, maybe a key biomarker. Uh, in the context of therapy, um, you know, fecal microbiota transplantation, as I mentioned in the beginning, is I think very exciting and interesting. Uh, what, but one of the challenges of the, um, these transplantation experiments is that you get a mixed community of microbes uh, that's quite heterogeneous between individuals and sometimes could also harbor pathogens. Um, so the development of more synthetic and sort of well-curated uh, microbial species, such as a probiotic that's engineered to express egg, it might be uh, more effective in the future. And for personalizing um, these therapeutic approaches, um, not only is it important to understand what microbes are in the microbiota, but what's, what genes and pathways in the host uh, that may be key to understanding whether the microbes are active. So in our studies, um, uh, in data, we, I didn't show you that NOT2, this host immune receptor was required. Um, so only those individuals that have a functional NOT2 allele um, would be receptive to this kind of therapeutic approach. Okay. Um, and lastly, I just want to end with a few um, comments and, and slides on potential small molecule therapeutics. So by understanding the mechanisms of the bacteria and this corresponding enzyme and it's the small molecules and metabolites it produced, it's led us to ask, what about the myropeptides itself? Could they be used as small molecule therapeutics that can be used in combination with the immunotherapy. And so this is something we're excited to pursue at Scripps. Um, should we re repurpose existing drugs and can we develop um, better not to agonists that would mimic uh, how the microbiota actually uh, functions? Okay. Um, and this has implications for infection, inflammation, and cancer, as I mentioned already. Um, okay, so one, um, a couple more experiments I wanna show you that leads us to, I think, a future direction here is that Matt actually has also tested this idea by directly evaluating these myropeptides uh, in mouse models of um, immunotherapy. So by comparing an active isomer versus an inactive uh, isomer of these myropeptides, that can really nicely show that only the active isomer uh, of the myropeptide inhibits tumor growth in combination with immunotherapy, as you can see here in the green line compared to the red and blue lines as controls. Um, he's also done additional mechanistic studies to understand the cells that are being activated in vivo and uh, for those aficionados here, this is a, one of these single cell RNA-seq plots where you can see that uh, specific subsets of myelid cells are being uh, activated and expanded upon the addition of these neuropeptides. Um, in the context of drug discovery, um, I want to go back a bit more and say that um, uh, these neuropeptides were discovered quite a while ago in the context of Florence adjuvant uh, and was developed as sort of drug derivatives in the late 90s. And as single agents were shown to be effective at um, preventing uh, cancer growth in mouse models, and was eventually developed into this drug called MEPAC that's, that's administered or distributed by this company, Takeda. Uh, and this is a drug that's used to treat recurrent osteosarcoma in children. So uh, after uh, kids have um, been diagnosed with osteosarcoma and um, the tumor is removed, 
um, they are given this drug to prevent the recurrence of the tumor as a single agent. Uh, and I'll just mention that our studies suggest that beyond the use of the single agent, um, perhaps uh, meat packs should be repurposed as a combination uh, small molecule or, or drug to enhance the, uh, the efficacy of existing immunotherapies. Um, so this is something ongoing that's actually happening in the field at the moment. Uh, but at Scripps, we're also wondering if we can prove the activity of NOD2 agonists by developing better generations of these drugs. Uh, and towards this end, a talented graduate student in my lab has um, taken advantage of structural biology studies of the NOD2 receptor itself, done some docking studies where you can now um, explore different compounds that may act like marimla peptides. Uh, these marimla peptides, um, the parent ones, have some pharmacological liability, so we would like to develop more stable ones that can act uh, with longer half-life in vivo. <laughs> so to do that, Takyu has modeled a series of dipeptides with synthetic small molecules um, by virtual screening. Uh, and through this process has actually synthesized several compounds, and so I'll show you here now, that are as active or maybe more active than the original or peptide itself here um, by screening the, this panel of small molecules and cell-based screens. Uh, and the dose response curves of some of the most interesting compounds are, compounds here are shown on the right. Uh, what's interesting, a few of these compounds uh, are as active as Remel dipeptides, and so we're quite excited about this. Um, but beyond our own sort of um, targeted um, medicinal chemistry studies, one of the great things about being here at Scripps is um, we have a really remarkable community for doing small molecule drug discovery. Uh, and in particular, uh, our collaboration with Caliper, this um, remarkable nonprofit drug discovery institute that's connected to Scripps, provides us an opportunity to find uh, additional small molecules. And some of you might already have noticed um, this uh, really important study uh, recently from Caliper um, to explore antiviral drugs for COVID um, by screening large collections of compounds that are uh, that are existing at Caliper. Um, so for this, uh, for our studies, we've actually now um, collaborated with Kristen Wilson, the group leader at Caliper. You can see Kristen here. And what's amazing at Caliper is that Caliper has these uh, really fancy robotics that can do high throughput screening of many, many compounds more than my laboratory can do. Uh, and on here, on the right here is a heat map of all the compounds that um, Kristen's team at Caliper has a screen. You can see every single dot on this heat map represents a new candidate small molecule that may act similarly to peptide um, to activate the NOT2 agonist, the NOT2 receptor. Um, what's also interesting is their screen also identified potential antagonists of NOT2 for us as a way to dampen the immune system in other contexts later. Okay. Um, so just let me summarize here um, what I've described here today from a few different studies from my group, um, that these bacterial species of Enterococcus, which express this remarkable enzyme SAGE, um, activates NOT2, and the presence of these bacteria uh, in animal models uh, per, uh, controls intestinal infections, uh, and in combination with immunotherapy can lead to decreased tumor growth um, in vivo. Uh, there's an interesting analogy of Enterococcus uh, with an existing, actually, vaccine uh, called BCG, uh, which also acts via the NOT2 pathway. And BCG is an attenuated strain of microbacteria that has been used as a vaccine for tuberculosis uh, because it broadly activates immune responses. It's also been explored against other pathogens, including respiratory viruses, and actually it's in clinical trials uh, for COVID-19. Recently, we'll see how those trials pan out um, in, the, in the years going forward. But in the States, BCG's activity for priming uh, immune response has also been used to treat bladder cancer. And um, in these contexts, uh, provides an interesting analogy to our discoveries of enterococcus, um, SAGE, and, and NOT2 activation. Um, and going forward, um, we also want to ask, you know, what are the sort of broader implications of SAGE-based probiotics and NOT2, uh, novel NOT2 agonists in the future? Uh, can these uh, engineered bacteria or new small molecule agonists be paired with existing vaccines to enhance their efficacy uh, towards other uh, infectious diseases, including respiratory viral infections, such as influenza virus, uh, RSV, and of course, I think um, it was on many folks in one of these days, uh, is SARS-CoV-2. Um, so these are, I think, new opportunities for us to do further ther therapeutic development scripts, which we're excited to engage. Um, and this is really one of the major reasons why I'm, I've really been excited to join scripts research. Okay. Um, so just let me close by just thanking all the people that have done um, the work over the years. There are some, I try to highlight them along the way here, but the, those individuals that are involved in the studies I described today are highlighted in red. Um, and we were sort of um, fortunate to be funded by the NIH and others here. They're 
summarize below. Um, you can see here for the collaborators I have on the right, this is one of the major reasons I've come to Scripps and has provided many new opportunities for new collaborations, which I'm excited to further explore in the future. Um, so I'll just close here by just have a couple of take home messages um, that uh, I hope I showed you that the microbiota is important for host physiology, um, the onset of disease and our response to therapy, um, and that new innovative approaches are still needed to dissect the functions of individual microbial species. In, in doing so, this gives us new opportunities to develop new therapeutic approaches and for new diagnostics. Uh, so I'll just close here and let uh, Jamie field any questions. Thank you very much. That was that was great. Um, it's I've been following along in in Q and A, and uh, we've had about a thousand people on, and uh, and what what people were following you is really interesting because a lots of the questions that people posed you at, answered later in your seminar. So it was great that. That you sort of uh, hit hit some of those already, um, you know. I think one, of, if I could aggregate a number of questions, I think people are are kind of interested in, you know, what is the path and the timeline. I mean, you definitely have this effect. You know what to give to people. So how do you how do you turn that into something that cancer patients can take advantage of? I mean, what's you know what what are the steps and how long is it going to be? I mean. It, I think people are wondering that because it seems remarkable and it is. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something we've been exploring ourselves. So I'll first just, first just say in terms of um, diagnostics, you know, I think what's important about what we've done is to demonstrate that Entrococcus spicalis is causative and it's related species. Um, first provides, I think a very important thing for clinicians to do is to ask in their patients, do they have these bacteria? And if they have those bacteria, you may predict that they may be more responsive to the existing immunotherapies that are around. Okay? So that's, I think, one of the most important um, impactful things that our study um, highlights. Um, going forward in terms of you know, leveraging um, the discovery of Tarkakis for drug um, development, you know, I already mentioned before that there's some problems of using Tarkakis, right? So we worry about that and there's potential pathogenesis is problematic. Um, but um, one of the things I'm excited about is like, identifying other microbial species that are not prone to pathogenesis may give us other microbes as a way to supplement immunotherapy um, as a nutritional supplement, okay? Um, so I think that's an exciting future to explore other microbial species besides enterococcus, okay? On the um, probiotic engineering front, okay? Um, you know, the fact that we've genetically engineered probiotics makes them no longer, you know, uh, nutritional supplements and now we have to go through the traditional path to the FDA. Okay? And so that's something important for us in terms of now having the synthetic strain to go through the proper regulatory and safety route before they can be administered and approved by the drug. So this will go through the traditional passes, traditional pathways of, of an FDA approved drug and require all the safety evaluation as any other drug. So that is probably in terms of timeline, probably one of the most challenging things. On the small molecule side of the things we've done, I think that there's a more traditional path of drug discovery uh, which we're excited now that there's some compounds that we, I think, can explore. Um, Howard, there, uh, a number of people were re really just interested in some basic stuff about microbiome. And, and, you know, one of the questions is, we all know that when we take antibiotics, it, you know, it has a dramatic effect on your microbiome. And, and you know, what comes back? How fast does it come back? Does it come back the same as it used to be? And, and you know, is that a time when you should take probiotics? And just, I, I know you know a lot of general facts about this, and I think people are kind of interested in that relationship. Yeah, it's also, you know, this makes us, it's a concerning with the whole microbiome and use of antibiotics, right? So there's no doubt that antibiotics has been remarkable, and we need that to fight infections. Um, and um, what's been observed in the field is that um, after antibiotic treatment, the major microbial species um, will come back, okay? but every use of antibiotics kind of permanently changes the composition over time. And the microbial species that rebounds often is connected to your diet, okay? And what things that you're exposed to, actually um, you often get a microbiota transfer from your pets even. So um, every bout of antibiotic uses will, will shift your microbiome a bit and it will be impacted by your own um, behavior and the foods you eat. Um, but rest assured that a lot of beneficial bacteria do come back, okay? So um, I don't wanna prescribe or, or you know, um, give the impression that we shouldn't use antibiotics. They're life-saving drugs for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so I think um, maybe, um, 
you have a lot of fans <laughs> in, in, uh, uh, good good reaction to this talk um so so i i think i, I think you might have touched on this in a seminar but but so can you just eat these muriamoid peptides that get released and have the same effect or 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 do you is do you need um a certain species there i mean what's what's the yeah so the muripeptides um are um themselves um have really poor um pharmacological properties in serum half life so they get digested right? in the upper gi maybe yeah they they don't really um so to um, improve their activity in vivo you know, the drug that's developed by Takeda is actually a liposome formulation that improves the circulation, right? So that um, drug is currently administered by uh, intravenous infusion um, when given um, to patients, um, but new versions are online now that may be orally available. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so Howard, how maybe could you give us a sense for how general this is? I mean, you found this remarkable connection between certain species and connected the dots down to the very receptor involved in the immune response. Uh, you know, how many stories like that are there? You know, is this just crazy or is this a really general thing that we should be kind of looking at? Yeah, so I think I'd say beyond our work, other laboratories around you know, the globe have also began to dissect the activities of individual bacterial species. And we're seeing similar themes, you know, other mic microbes may be hitting different receptors, but. Um, so more of that is coming online. Um, I think for us, the generality, I think, can really be highlighted by um, actually the analysis of the similar enzymes in the microbiome, right? So by doing that and, and looking at sort of genetic similarities between those enzymes, we may find that other microbes may be functioning in a similar manner. And I think that's something that's exciting and important for us to do in the future is to ask how general is this and do a lot of microbes act this way or do only specific rare species that we pick up to this? Uh, to have an interesting question. Um, uh, so if you're at home and you're curious about the state of your microbiome, what is there in terms of home diagnostic? Um, well, there's been actually quite a um, few sort of um, microbiome sampling. You know, I think there are kits you can buy that you can actually, you know, um, uh, take a sample of your own microbiome. Um, DNA sequencing is cheap enough that you can you know, find the appropriate um, laboratory or clinician um, to actually do sequencing. And actually it's quite inexpensive to do that. And um, some of those of you that are in San Diego know that, um, may know that Rob Knight, who's at UCSD, has initiated the human, sort of the American Microbiome Project mm -hmm. that's just sampling the microbiota from different people, um, not directly connected to disease necessarily, but just to see how diverse and broad microbial species are. Um, so that's another uh, big approach. Um, to, for sort of home sampling, I guess, if, if you will. Right. Okay, uh, Howard, I think we're coming up close to the end and I did wanna to touch on a more general topic. So so I, I, I guess I wanna ask you, how did you become a scientist? Ah, that's a good and question. How, how, did you, how did you get to where you are? I mean, it, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I recited your, your academic pedigree, but you became a scientist you know, before then, and how, how did that, how did that happen? Yeah, so I guess, you know, I, I have to say that, you know, I was not one of these kids that was really fascinated with science at a very young age, and I kind of struggled with what I was interested in, um, but when I got to college, you know, um, I just fell in love with organic chemistry, and that's what, for me, sort of um, connected uh, me to science and the love of small molecules and how they, they function, and over the years, you know, the molecules have gotten bigger, <laughs> and are more complex. complex. And, um, you know, I just got interested in how molecules interact with biology over time. And that over the years led me to um, infectious diseases and microbes and um, modulating the immune system. So, you know, I think um, I was very lucky to have some great mentors and, and, and teachers at UC Santa Cruz that really got me interested in, in chemistry. So you didn't have a chemistry set in your basement when you were- I, I did not. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was kind of a late bloomer, um, yeah. but now I'm hooked. Yeah. Yeah, terrific. Um, so uh, I did. I did want to just share one other little personal thing uh, with with Howard, uh, or with with the with the audience. Uh, Howard does have some outside activities, um, and uh, so how, I I hope you can see this. But this is this is uh, Howard at Torrey Pines uh, in last December. I think it was New Year's Eve, and uh, I'm the photographer. 
because I was too chicken to get in the water that day. It was too big, but this is a pretty nice uh, shot. And uh, Howard and I do enjoy uh, surfing pretty regularly together. So it's not all science all the time, but I guess- Most we, of the time. We, it's most of the time. And we do talk about science when we're sitting there in between, uh, in between waves. So yeah. uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's great to have colleagues like Howard at Scripps Research. And uh, so thank you all for tuning in. I just wanted to mention again and remind you that the next front row is Jeff Kelly, which will be Wednesday, September 15th, 1 p.m. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this show is required, uh, recorded and you can get it uh, at the front row and the website. So uh, thanks for participating and thanks Howard for a terrific lecture. Thank you everybody for attending. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.